repart, reprise, repeat, and replicate, establishing foundations for understanding long-term changes in marine biodiversity. <coughs> Thank you all for coming after lunch. Appreciate it. I'm Megan Mock. I'm a postdoc with Fiorenza McKelly at Hopkins Marine Station and with the uh, PG Natural History Museum. So some folks at Hopkins got together recently and sat down to think a bit about how this system is changing. And they were interested because there's a number of different hypotheses that they themselves have had because they've been watching the system change. And they wanted to know if we can actually test this question of how has the system been changing in the intertidal and in the nearshore ecosystem, um, which is how my postdoc came to be. So just to walk you through what we've been working on. Uh, ecosystems are changing, and those changes have often been attributed to anthropogenic in impacts. But understanding how the systems are responding really takes a, a long-term set of data. Just understanding the last few years doesn't give us a complete picture of the ecosystem and its responses. We see this in an example from Atlantic Cod and in many systems, but Atlantic Cod is a great one because over the last 30 years, if we look at the data set, there isn't a lot of changes in the abundance of landings. In fact, there's, it, not only is there no change, but there's an incredibly low abundance. But if we look back over the last 150 years, we see a loss, a drop of eight or nine times this population. And over time, we have attributed this change to the fisheries of the system. Not only have we identified the change, but we've set conservation targets because of this historic data and we've actually set a whole, a whole management team for this fishery. Um, this has been true for a few different species, and it's been reviewed in uh, McLenahan. This is a, a great paper. I highly recommend if you're interested in historical ecology. Um, one of the reasons for this problem, while there is this set of data, there just aren't a lot of places where we have access to this kind of historical data. Uh, one system where we might be able to look a bit more into long-term data sets is in the, along the shoreline, in the intertidal and in the rocky near shore. Uh, this is because, and probably a reason a lot of us are here, this is a, an easier system to go out and sample than a lot of other marine systems. It's hard to go diving uh, way offshore. It's hard to get a boat. It takes a lot of money to sample other kinds of marine systems. But in the rocky intertidal, we have a better chance of sampling all year long, getting high replication. Um, it's also a system that is subject to changes from the, the uh, terrestrial system, from people developing these systems. Um, and we also, it's also a place where we have hot spots of research. Uh, marine stations along the coast have had long-term data uh, collecting happening over the last 100, 150 years. And I'm gonna focus on one of those locations, the Hopkins Marine Station in Monterey Bay. Um, over the last 150 years, and, and beyond that, people have been walking along these shores, sampling, seeing how systems have been changing. And that led to this question of how has the intertidal and shallow subtidal marine biodiversity of Monterey Bay changed in, since the mid-19th century? Now this is a great question and one that, you know, we're all trying to answer across the board. And I, I've seen a lot of talks uh, during the session at WSN where people are, are addressing this very question. Um, and we have run into this same problem that a lot of people have, which is that, how do you find this data? And that's where my postdoc has come in and the question that I'm answering, which is what data exists to answer this question. I'm gonna talk a bit about the process that we're going through to collect that data. Um, we're doing a historical data search and using complementary approaches. So the first portion is what I'm working on. I'm looking at intertidal and subtidal communities um, single species are also interesting, and hopefully we'll be able to get to those in the future, but right now we're focusing on communities. This will allow us to answer questions about species turnover, uh, changes in abundance over time, and along with this historic data search that we're doing, we're looking at oral histories uh, from researchers that have been at the Hopkins Marine Stations in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, asking them questions and getting information about um, species that are hi to highlight that we're not actually finding in the data sets, you know, if a species is very abundant, you might not actually make note of it in your data set. You're looking at something rare, something that might be changing, maybe not that big pile of black abalone, as somebody pointed out recently, um, that you stepped over to get to the next species. 
Uh, it's also interesting for developing hypotheses, things that we might, questions we might not be asking just based on the data sets, uh, things that people have noticed in the past. So for the historic data search, um, we are focusing across this, uh, this 150 year span. The big difference here is that before the 1920s, most of the information that we're finding is descriptive. There was a change in the 1930s where Willis Hewitt went out and he laid out a quadrat and he counted things in that quadrant, and we can now repeat that method. Um, and and are doing well. And I'm looking to see if anyone has memory. So in the 1930s to the 1980s, I'm focusing my search. Um, but we're also looking in the 90s to 2015s in search of studies that are repeating those earlier studies. Um, I'm looking at journals, reports, and most importantly, I found student papers. Students have really focused on the system and have unique method for collecting data. Um, and within each of these studies, I'm looking for quantitative data, so abundances of species, as well as semi-quantitative, is it rare, common, or abundant? Uh, we're also taking note of anyone who's describing the inner title. I walked through the rocky shore, and there were piles of urchins at my feet. Um, we're not sure what to do with that information at this time, but you know, in the future, we'll now have a place for it to be located. And for each of these studies, we're going in and saying, has anyone repeated this study? Has it been repeated multiple times? Or should it be considered for replication based on a series of criteria that we're assigning to the paper? Uh, does it have high quality taxonomic information? Is it quantitative? Has it been replicated within a single site or across the region or seasonally? Um, I'm not saying that you should, it has to have all four of these to be considered, but you can, will be able to go through this database and see how well it aligns with these criteria. Um, and then we're assigning papers that fall out within them. So as far as the studies so far, we have 37 quantitative studies. Uh, we believe that we've reached the asymptote, so it's very unlikely that we're going to double the number of studies, but we're still adding uh, studies to this database. There are 17 semi-quantitative studies so far, and we've completed eight in-person interviews. I'm going to talk a little bit about those 37 quantitative studies. Um, we've found 17 data sets for the Hopkins Marine Station, the Rocky Intertidal and Near Shore at the Hopkins Marine Station. Uh, but studies have spanned all the way up through Santa Cruz and down to Carmel. And here are the communities that we've focused on so far. Uh, you can see that most of them are in the Rocky, specifically the Rocky subtitle, Kelp and the Benthic Rocky subtitle. Uh, but they span all the way through Middle East communities and Endocladia, somebody looking in the Kelp forecast system. Um, and within these results, we were interested in who, what has already been repeated. So we found five different studies that have been repeated. Um, they, again, span all of these different communities specifically the Rocky title, mostly, or Rocky subtitle. And I'm going to talk a bit about this hewitt sagarin transect, which is still continuing to be sampled today. Uh, Willis Hewitt went out and he was a student at Hopkins in the early 1930s, and he laid out this transect in front of the Hopkins Marine Station, a 108-yard transect. He took out his uh, one-yard quadrat and sampled a swath that went from the high to the low inner title and through all of the um, the, inner, the tide pools there. And then Rafe Sagarin came back in the early 1990s as a student with Sarah Gilman and sampled this uh, transect again. He repeated the sampling, uh, I think it's seven times, until recently Jim Watanabe and Theo McKelly have been taking students out to continue sampling this transect. So we're starting to get a bit more of a repeat sample on this long-term data set. There was also a student in the from the from Berkeley in the late 1940s that went out and sampled a few quadrats along this transect. So we have an interesting span of data. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the results that Rafe found. That I, a lot of you have already heard these results, but we're going to add a little bit more on top of it. Um, we have recently assembled all of this data. Uh, Rafe's <laughs> wife is letting us play with the data a bit, and we've added the more recent data sets to it. So in 93, or in this 95 science paper, they looked at the change of species comparing 1932 to 1993 and found that northern species were leaving the system and southern species were increasing in this uh, swath of uh, the Rocky Intertidal that they had resampled. We can now talk about this change compared to 2015. And you see that it's 
there's a little bit of a, a different story, which is that while northern species are still leaving the system, the southern species, there hasn't been a big change in the southern species. Now this is, these are both single snapshots. This is 1993 change and the 2015 change. So it'll be interesting, we actually have a big, uh, a much larger data set and as we're getting a chance to explore the data to ask more questions about individual species and also this system has been resampled a number of times now. It's not just a single snapshot in time. So for our project, uh, we're part way through the year assembling the database, looking for patterns. We are planning to set up online accessibility and making it a living document so that other people can add data sets. And I've heard recently that they're considering doing something like this up at Bodega, so potentially creating something that spans the coast a bit more. And moving into the future, adding single species, keystone species, um, foundation species, and being able to actually go into some of the studies to compare the changes over time. But the story and the thoughts that I want to leave you with from this talk are, why is this important? So for this study, we want to know about change. And it's not enough to just have a single study. It's the suite of studies that are interested in the long-term data, the historic ecology, and the complementary methods piled on top of each other to fill in those gaps. So in our case, we're using oral interviews, but there are uh, photographs, newspaper articles, the shell middens that are along the coast. There's all kinds of ways that we can answer this question that move beyond just looking at the data. And for me, there's a number of reasons why we should do this. One is establishing baselines. We have this problem of shifting baselines. If we want to understand how systems are changing, we can't just look over the last 20 years. Um, understanding biological invasions. If uh, so, species invade, if they spread, they're migrating, we want to understand how the, these systems are changing. We need to have a, a established that, well, really the baseline. Um, looking at climate change effects, and finally setting conservation targets for these different systems and for these different changes. Again, the McClenahan paper, I highly recommend, it's very interesting. Um, so thank you very much, it's my talk. I, I hope that you have uh, thought about your study compared to how things have changed over the last 100 years. And also, if you have any ideas for data that you would recommend for me, old studies um, in this system, I, I would highly, I would love to talk to you about it. So, thank you very much. Thank you.